This is Episode 1 of Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Richard Norton Smith. It starts after this. Can you remember the very first moment in your life that history mattered to you? Well, history was always very uh, personalized uh, to me. I, I'm, history existed in the memories and the stories of elderly people around me, and particularly my uh, maternal grandparents. Um, my grandfather was born in 1895, my grandmother in 1899, and um, I spent an inordinate amount of time around them growing up and listening to their stories about the past. And first of all, um, I, I gave me, I guess, a, a bias. Um, unlike professional historians, I, I was always much more interested in the people than in the social forces, um, factors beyond personal control. Um, and I was always interested in history as a, a narrative art. It's uh, the story of people and um, um, their individual struggles and achievements and their collective struggles and achievements. I remember um, one very early <laughs> seed planted. As you know, I'm a hurricane freak. I have tracked every storm since I was seven. And, um, but even before that, um, I remember hearing them talk about the great New England hurricane of 1938 and the, uh, literally the physical impact that it had. This was a storm that nobody was prepared for. Of course, it was pre-satellite era, um, and hurricanes didn't hit New England. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why people were complacent, um, and um, they were um, among the complacent, and they experienced this um, storm that they obviously never forgot, and could still vividly describe um, for their grandson's benefit 40, 50 years later. Um, so, you know, that was, um, and, 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 and I think perhaps uh, beginning with them, I made it my business to become well acquainted with lots of older people in town. Um, I mean, it was one of the first things, I suppose, that set me apart from my peers. Uh, I was always much more comfortable around an 80-year-old than uh, an 8-year-old. And um, again, they had stories to tell. Um, they were each in their own way a mystery to be um, solved. And uh, so, you know, they bred curiosity. What did you do with that information? Um, well, actually, it's, it's interesting. You, uh, the first book I wrote, uh, locally published, needless to say, but it was a wonderful apprenticeship. I wrote a, a town history. The, the previous history was uh, 1878, so a lot had happened since then. And this was in 1978. And, what um, town, by the way? Uh, Townsend, Massachusetts. Townsend was... I used to say physically in Massachusetts and spiritually in New Hampshire, although now southern New Hampshire has become an extension of Massachusetts. But in those days, it was a town of 4,000 people, about 50 miles northwest of Boston, right on the hugging the New Hampshire line. And it had a very rich history. And, um, but it seemed to me that um, it had an even richer untold history, much of it that I uh, accumulated through uh, discussions with uh, older folks um, who made World War I and World War II um, come alive. And um, it was a, I was very lucky. It was, a, it was a company town for a very long time. It housed the world's allegedly second largest cooperage or barrel making factory. In fact, my, my grandfather worked for many, many years there. And it was classic, you know, there was a family that lived in a house on the hill. They were the Pheasantons, and the house was called Windy Crest. And I had a great aunt who worked briefly as a maid 
at Windy Crest, which gave me an opening. But then I got to know the Fezzidans. And in particular, and this is where the history sort of bleeds into biography, although I think they're inseparable. Um, I thought a very poignant instance. In 1960, you know, the world had moved on. It didn't need a lot of wooden barrels anymore. And the Fezzanins had to close this enormous, I mean, I lived to see it, and this enormous um, complex of buildings that comprised this barrel-making enterprise. And the last of the of the family um, responsible for the company was a man named Stanley Fezzanin. And Stanley was a classic New Englander, um, seemingly emotionally distant, um, a bit remote, um, a condition that was probably exacerbated by his status. But I thought even more so by the feelings that he entertained, no doubt mixed feelings, including some feelings of guilt and even failure, that it had fallen to his lot to be the member of his family that presided over the end of this century-old enterprise and all that it had meant for the town. And um, I got to know him. And it was very late in his life, um, really the last three or four years of his life. He, would, um, he went to an office every day on the site of the factory. I don't know what he did. I don't think he did very much, but it was, you know, keeping alive his connection. And I went and we talked and talked and talked. And I don't think he talked a lot. I don't think he, um, well, I, I don't think he had a lot of people, um, perhaps to whom he felt he could talk. And, um, and after he died, I remember I saw him on the last day of his life. I went to the hospital. I had pancreatic cancer, and, you know, what do you say to people at that point? But I'm, you know, but after he died, uh, his son was kind enough to give me his desk, his great big desk that he had used, uh, um, <laughs> which filled up most of the room, whatever room it was in. Um, and so then I wrote a, a sequel to the town history because all of Stanley's papers, all the company's papers, all of the family's papers came to me. And, um, and again, it was a wonderful apprenticeship because it, it combined oral history, um, talking about a history that was very close in time and proximity, but, um, but also supplemented by a vast amount of archival research. And I learned very early, there's, there's just no substitute for... Um, you know, when, when I did my biography of Tom Dewey, which was the first sort of commercially published book, published in 1982, I went to Rochester, New York for a year. Um, I still remember, I've, I, I've got an apartment for $260 a month, a mile from the library. I would walk every day to the library, be there at 9 o'clock when it opened, would sit in a carrel for eight hours, going through boxes of paper. Governor Dewey's papers had been left there. Someone asked him why, he said, because no one else asked. So anyway, there were hundreds and hundreds of boxes. And I, you know, went through it all and took notes and then would go home in the evening and write. And this monster book, I mean, it's over 700 pages of text and over a thousand footnotes, was researched and written in an insane 18 months. Um, which, again, only testifies to what you can do when you're very young and very obsessed uh, with whatever you're doing. But again, it, it, it set the pattern that there's just, there's no, I mean, I'm sure there are, there are alternatives. I never found an alternative to exhaustive personal archival research. I've never used a research assistant, um, mostly because I wouldn't know how to use a research assistant. I think that it is, it's interesting. You want 
the product to be as objective as possible, but you recognize that the process is necessarily subjective. And by that I mean um, you and only you have a sixth sense about what anecdote, what quote, what letter, what story, what factoid will contribute to your overall portrait, will reveal something uh, with an economy of expression, which um, may seem strange coming from someone who writes 700-page books, but that is not something that I felt I could subcontract. Now, other people do, and they're very successfully, and it in no way diminishes, you know, obviously, their intellectual contribution, but it's just, that's how I, and I'm too old to, to change. The year of your birth? 1953. I share a birthday with Groucho Marx and Mahatma Gandhi, uh, neither of whom I am often mistaken for. P- probably closer to Groucho than the Mahatma. Why, why do you know that? <laughs> why not? I know. I mean, <laughs> I, I, let's just say I have a lot of useless information. Well, what, um, what is Groucho Marx to you and what is Mahatma Gandhi to you? Oh, well, they're heroes in a way. Groucho uh, is... Uh, Anarchic. He's not just funny, but he's obviously a, a rebel. Um, but of course, Groucho couldn't have been Groucho without Margaret Dumont. So that's that's the thing. This wonderful, uh, quintessential dowager, um, um, always rich, always um, um, overdressed, overjeweled, uh, the the perfect. Um, cliche of the the rich society lady who is said to be clueless, while this um, um, uh, anarchic, um, improbable figure is uh, pulling her leg. And what was uh, that relationship? <laughs> well, in, in movie after movie after movie, um, the the two of them were in effect the protagonist, and it never it never varied. Um, he was the leering. Um, uh, wisecracking, double hondondering, if there is such a word, um, um, vet noir, uh, and she was the, uh, you know, uh, the mountainous, clueless uh, personification of the upper crust. When, when did Groucho Marx die? Groucho Marx, I want to say, died in the late 70s, I believe. Um, what his television show? Well, yeah, uh, that's right. Um, I mean, but what 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 impact did his television show have on what we see today? Well, it's interesting. It broke all the rules. I mean, it was a game show that was not a game show. It was really a, a, a vehicle. It was a, an opportunity for Groucho to be Groucho, to get off uh, one-liners, um, sometimes quasi-shocking, um, often very clever, uh, to wisecrack at the expense of the nominal contestants, who um, were, among other things, frequently asked to identify who was buried in Grant's tomb. Um, shades of, uh, of, of our own um, uh, later literary endeavors. Um, <laughs> you know, and he had a sidekick, George Fenneman, who was as bland, you know, as, as Groucho was, overspiced. Uh, and it was, just, it was just a perfect formula. And, and, and it was the 50s. You know, the supposedly bland 50s. And, and Groucho was this wonderful uh, f- uh, breath of irreverent fresh air. I always remember, say the secret word and the And the duck, duck comes down. The duck Which comes was a, down. a totally pointless exercise. <laughs> totally. But, that was, but that was the whole point of the show. <laughs> it was, it, I'm, I'm sure, later comics built on the, you know, the, the illogic. Of, uh, of Groucho. So what about Mahatma Gandhi? Well, Mahatma Gandhi, obviously, on a much more serious uh, vein. I'll never forget, um, I told the story in my eulogy, but... Um, Your eulogy? Uh, of, of, of President Ford, my eulogy <laughs> of President Ford, who at the turn of the century was asked by Time magazine, along with a number of other prominent people, to identify uh, his candidate for the, the greatest figure of the 20th century. And I assumed um, wrongly that you know he would have picked a Churchill or Eisenhower and in fact he 
surprised me, he said Mahatma Gandhi. And his second, because they wanted a, a second in case yours had already been taken, his second was was Sadat. And I thought, you know, that's really interesting. You know, two figures from the third world, um, men of color, each of whom distinguished himself in opposing colonialism. Um, and it was just it was, it's one more reminder that you should never fall into the era of assuming or presuming you know people or or uh, or their uh, or their preferences. But anyway, Mahatma Gandhi is, of course, the 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 great sort of unlikely um, figure who um, was at one time a South African warrior um, who aspired to success in that genre and who came early in life to be radically transformed. Um, it's a bit like George Washington, who as a young man wanted nothing more than to um, be promoted in the British Army and to be uh, socially successful, to be to enjoy the, the status and the wealth and the prerogatives that went with a certain position in the British colonial establishment. And, but that's not what we remember Washington for. It's the, the transformation and Washington the rebel, and, and likewise Gandhi, who, who became much more than a rebel, who became a source of inspiration for, for example, Martin Luther King and for many others, who, whose, whose gospel of nonviolent resistance to oppressive government uh, would become a theme running throughout the century. Um, and who became, certainly I think while he was alive, the largest figure of his time, a kind of um, much more than a nationalist, although he's, he's inseparable from the birth of modern India, from its breakaway from the British Empire, but he became, in the end, larger than India. Do, do you have a photographic memory? I don't think so. I think I have an unusual memory. I, I have a curious... Um, I have sort of a grab bag mind uh, memory. Um, I do have... And I suspect lots of people have this, maybe not even aware of it. I have... Um, I've, I've compared it to a flypaper. I have a flypaper memory for things I'm interested in or for research that I'm doing. I mean, I can tell you 40 years later the source of a footnote in the Dewey book. Um, it's no great shakes um, and it's no particular value, um, I, but I might not remember what I had for breakfast. And I suspect there are lots of people like that who have selective memories that are overdeveloped in some areas. Richard Norton Smith is an American historian and author. You can listen to more interviews with him by searching his name in the video library at cspan.org.